people. Hi everybody. Okay, I'm going to get started because I've got a lot of awesome things that I want to share with you today. And it's really about something that we are all very conscious of and that's what's going on in the world today. All of the violence, the unrest, the virus, the political upheaval, you know, and there's so much going on. And as Christians and as believers, it's tempting to feel really disheartened. It's, it's tempting to get really discouraged and think, oh, what's the point of all this? Is there actually anything that I can do? And so what I wanted to do today is encourage you that there is something that you as a believer can do, that we as believers can do. We are not powerless in this situation. We are not hopeless. God has given us awesome tools. He's given us by his grace everything that we need to do to get through this, to get through to the other side. And in fact, not just get through it, but make a change in what's going on in the world today. So I don't even need to list off all the things that are going on. Coronavirus, uh, strife and division, the rise of immorality. There's laws that are being passed that support ungodliness and things that are an abomination to God. There's even more concerning is now the suppression and the censorship of the gospel and of Christian voices. And, you know, <laughs> it's funny though, because, you know, churches, we go to church and we, we sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And we sing these songs and we sing, there's an army rising up, right? But where is the evidence of that? <laughs> you know, and that's awesome. And we need to sing those songs to encourage us, but we need to start putting some corresponding action to all these awesome battle cries that we're making because faith without corresponding action is dead. Faith without corresponding action is useless. So it's all good to believe that we have the authority, we have the power, we're, an, uh, we're the army of God, but we have to actually do something with that and put corresponding action to that. Otherwise, we're not going to see any effect. We're not going to have any benefit to that. And so you may have noticed too that the, the three different responses to all the things that are going on in the world is Christians either are getting angry, outraged and frustrated. And you only have to look at social media to see where, you know, where people's hearts are. And it's mainly at people. Oh, I can't believe this politician. I can't believe this person. I can't believe they've, they've done this. You know, and they, their anger and frustration is directed at people. And then some other people are feeling hopeless and depressed and discouraged and almost slipping into a state of apathy, not wanting to even think about it or look at it because they are helpless, uh, feel helpless and they don't know what to do. But the third response that we should have is that we can have a righteous anger. We can have a righteous anger at the devil and what he is trying to do in our nation, what the devil has done so far and is getting away with. And then we put corresponding action to that based on what God has given us, the tools that God has given us. Okay, so that's a good reaction to have a righteous anger our anger isn't directed at people. Our anger should be directed at the devil and what the devil is trying to get away with in our nation. So what I'm going to share with you today will encourage you and empower you and it will equip you to, to put corresponding action to your outrage, to your frustration at what's going on and actually be able to do something. You can do something. We as the body of Christ can do something about what's going on. And if you look at Romans 12 verse 21, Romans 12 verse 21, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if you look at this scripture, there's two scenarios going on. We're either being overcome by evil or we're doing the overcoming. We're either being overcome or we are doing the overcoming. So there's no fence sitting, there's no being passive, there's no just hoping it all goes away if I ignore it. There's actually action that's required on our part to make a difference and do something about what's going on. 
Okay, so if we see something that's going on in our nation, in our society, in our culture that goes in direct contradiction to the word of God, then we are authorized by God to do something about it. And it is, in fact, our responsibility to do something about it. Okay, so the most important thing that we have to remember, guys, and you may have seen a post I did a couple of days ago. This is the most important thing that we have to remember. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. That is the most life-changing attitude that you can have. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We do not wrestle with people. We do not wrestle with politicians. We do not wrestle with governments. We do not wrestle with people who are trying to restrict and censor the preaching of the gospel. They are not our enemy. They are being used by the enemy. They are not our enemy. And it says that in Ephesians 6 verse 12, that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We are wrestling with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. They are the enemy. People are not our enemy. The people are being used by the enemy because just like God needs a body to operate and function in this earth, the devil needs a body to operate and function in this earth. He can't come in and just do what he wants when he wants. He needs people who are willing, who submit themselves to his thoughts, to his lies and his suggestions to carry out his wicked plans in the earth. And these people are people who aren't saved. They don't, well, in fact... There are a lot of saved people that the devil uses as well because there's people. it's anybody whose minds aren't renewed to the word of God, to who we are in Christ. They are not uh, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They don't know the difference between right and wrong based on what the word says. So they just think, oh, let's, let's do this. It makes sense. It's their version of truth. Okay, so they are just submitting to the enemy's lies, to the enemy's suggestions, to the enemy's thoughts. And he's actually using them like a puppet. But they, the, the person themselves is not our problem. Do you know that God loves those people? God loves them. He's already saved them. They just have to receive that salvation. They, you know, one day if they receive Jesus, they will be in heaven with us. <laughs> so we have to see the person. In fact, we have to have compassion on these people and we have to pray for them that their eyes are open so that they will no longer be enslaved to the, uh, to the enemy. Okay, so the most important thing again to remember is we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. And there's an awesome example that I've used several times and that is the example of a bullfighter. Some of you may be familiar with, um, you know, in Spain and those kind of countries, they have bullfights, or they used to. And the, the matador is the man that's dressed up in the costume, and he's in the ring, and he's got a red cape. And they release the bull into the ring, and the bull is charging that red cape over and over and over again. And the, the matador is holding this red cape out, and he's waving it around and it's irritating the bull, it's infuriating the bull and the bull is charging this red cape over and over and over again. And what ends up happening is the bull gets completely exhausted, totally worn out and that's when the matador can go in for the kill strike, okay? But see, the, the cape actually isn't the bull's problem. The matador is the problem. If the bull could recognize that it's the matador behind the cape that is the source of his irritation, the source of his frustration and his real problem and directed his attack at the matador instead of the cape, then the fight would be over really quickly. Okay, and that's such a great example because we as Christians... It's where sometimes like that bull, we're charging at these red capes, we're charging at people, we're charging at policies, we're charging at laws, we're charging at all of these things that are irritating and frustrating us and we're thinking, we're directing all of our, our frustration and annoyance at this red cape, but in fact it's the devil behind it that is the source of our problem. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. So if we can now recognize that the enemy is, the devil is our true enemy and direct our attack at him, then the fight will be over much faster. 
Does that make sense? I love that example. I love that illustration. So again, people are not our problem. The devil is our problem. Okay. And in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures that, that reinforce this. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, it says, The God of this world, so small g, God of this world or of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. The devil, the God of this world, has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, people who are hostile to the gospel, who, who refuse to acknowledge truth. The devil has blinded their eyes. The God of this age has blinded their eyes so that they cannot see. And you might, okay, so you might look at things like abortion, for example, and you might think, what in the world? Like, how, that can, how can anybody pass a law that, that supports the killing of innocent babies? How can anyone do that? Like, it doesn't make sense. It's crazy. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes so that they cannot see the truth of the gospel. They can't see the truth. They can't see the logic. They can't see the common sense in it because their eyes have been blinded. And that's why. And you know, we often say, can't they see how ridiculous this is? No, they can't because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 2, it says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you used to walk when you conformed to the ways of the world and the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay, the spirit, the, the ruler of the power of the air is the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience or the sons of willful disbelief. So again, this just reinforces the fact that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. Our problem, our fight is not with a person, a law, a policy, a politician. Our fight, our wrestle, our battle is against the devil. Okay, so if we can learn to recognize that, if we can recognize that our enemy is not a natural enemy, but it is a spiritual enemy, and we have all the tools, the weapons, the arsenal of weapons that God needs us to use against the enemy, and if we take our fight to the arena of faith, we will win every time, every time because we are already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus far above all of the power of the enemy. So we already are seated in a position of authority over the enemy. And all we have to do is employ the tools and the weapons that God has given us to put him back in his place, which is under our feet. Amen. Now I want to give you a little story just about how effective prayer and taking our fight to the spiritual realm can be. Okay, this is about the Dunkirk evacuation. And if you've listened to my podcast, you may have heard this story, but I'm going to tell you again because it's awesome. Um, I'm just going to read you this passage, okay? And it's about the Dunkirk evacuation that happened in World War II. So it was May 1940 and Adolf Hitler had unleashed his troops against France and Belgium. The Allied troops in the Nazis' path were surrounded by the Germans on three sides with the sea behind them. The Allies were trapped. German high command boasted that their troops were, quote, proceeding to annihilate the British army. And Prime Minister Winston Churchill was preparing himself to deliver the news that more than 300,000 soldiers had been captured or killed. Okay, so over a quarter of a million soldiers were trapped on the beach at Dunkirk. Late that month, George VI, who was the King of England at the time, called for a national day of prayer. The British people devoted themselves entirely to prayer for the day. And I'm sure there was a lot of prayer going on around that day as well, but particularly for that day. Congregations swelled and queues formed outside the churches. 
At the same time, the military decided to evacuate all the soldiers it could. Unable to field enough military ships to carry all the endangered troops, a call went out asking for the aid of any vessel willing to cross the English Channel and assist in saving the trapped men. And more than 800 vessels answered that call. Now, this is the cool part, okay? As the Allied troops, now just remember, there's, there was a national day of prayer going on in England for all of these soldiers. As the Allied troops prepared to evacuate, Hitler inexplicably called his troops to a halt. For three days, Nazi tanks and soldiers stood idly by as allies, as the Allies frantically evacuated their men. At the same time, Poor weather grounded the German Air Force and allowed Allied soldiers to reach the beaches and the evacuation without hindrance. The evacuation itself took place on unusually calm seas. And actually someone else told me that while the vessels were carrying all the troops back to England, there was a thick fog that covered the English Channel. So they weren't even, any aircraft weren't even able to see any of the vessels that were carrying the, the troops away. It was called the Miracle of Dunkirk, and it was just that miraculous. To this day, historians are baffled as to why Hitler suddenly called a halt to his advance when victory was all but assured. The German generals themselves were clueless as to why they were not allowed to chase down and obliterate the Allies. It doesn't matter how much it looks like the enemy is overtaking your nation. It doesn't matter how hopeless the situation looks. It doesn't matter how trapped we feel. And it doesn't matter whether it looks like all is lost. If believers will pray, we can change the course of history. There is something that we can do about this. Okay, amen. That's such an awesome story. See, they, Hitler was the enemy there. Hitler was the person behind all of that. But the believers had to take their fight to a supernatural level. There was no reasoning with Hitler. There was no saying, come on, Adolf, you know, <laughs> get off your power trip. Come on. You know, there was none. They couldn't do that. They had to take their battle to the supernatural realm. And that's when a miraculous Thing took place that didn't make any sense in the natural and it wasn't anything that anybody could have planned or concocted and said let's do this and this is going to happen it all happened as the result of prayer okay so again we cannot fight spiritual battles with natural means second corinthians 10 verse 4 says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they are not of the five physical senses our weapons are not things we can see, feel, hear, touch, taste, or smell. Our weapons are supernatural, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. It doesn't matter how big or thick or impenetrable the um, stronghold might appear, the weapons that God has given us are strong enough, strong enough and powerful enough to pull that stronghold down. God has given us mighty spiritual weapons. In Romans 5 verse 20, it says, Where sin increases, grace much more increases. So it doesn't matter how dark and how desperate and how hopeless the world situation might look, there is more than enough grace to cover that, those situations and to deal with them. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is, his grace is sufficient for us. His power is perfected in our weakness. Now, I'm not going to go into a big theological discussion about that scripture, but that, that word perfected, where it says his power is perfected in weakness, that word perfected literally means his power adds what is lacking in order to make something complete. So his power, his grace is sufficient. It adds what we are lacking in the natural to make our victory complete. His power is perfected in our weakness. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 
that he delights in weaknesses, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We can delight in all the turmoil and chaos that's going on in the world today because where we are weak in the natural, God is strong. His grace is more than enough. His grace will be perfected in those areas where we are weak. We don't have to despair. We don't have to be discouraged or afraid or worried. We can take delight in those things because we are not relying on our own abilities and our own strength to do anything about it. Where we are weak in the natural, everything that God has provided by his grace, we are strong. We are strong and it's more than enough to get the job done. Amen? Okay, so what is the grace that God has given us? What is, what is the grace that is sufficient for us? What has God given us in order to deal with the devil, to deal with the, the true enemy? Okay, what is the grace that is um, our spiritual weapon, that is mighty through God to the, to the pulling down of strongholds? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Now, what I'm going to tell you is available to every single one of you. Every single one of you, if you are a believer, if you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, this is what is available to you. But we have to learn how to use it and we have to put it to use. Okay, remember faith without corresponding action or works is dead. It's useless. Okay, so we're going to activate our faith by putting corresponding action to it. In Genesis 1 verse 28, God told man to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Do you know that you were created to have dominion in this earth and to subdue it? That's what your purpose was when God created you. When God created us, he didn't intend us to just lay down and take all of the things that life threw at us. He intended us to take dominion over them and subdue them. What does that word subdue mean? I love, I love this. Subdue means to dominate, tread down, force into line, and bring into bondage. Basically, it means if anything gets out of line or out of place or veers away from the way God set it up to be, if anything goes in contradiction to the word, we were created to dominate it, to tread it down, to force it into line and to bring it into bondage. That is how God created us to be. He created us to have dominion in this earth and to subdue it. That includes Things that the enemy is trying to do in our nation, in our government, it includes the weather, it includes coronavirus, anything that is out of line with God's word and the way God created us to function and operate. We have authority, we were created to have dominion over it and to subdue it. In Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19, and this is how we do it, guys. I'm going to tell you how to do this, okay? Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19, it says, Jesus is talking to Peter and it says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, now notice that word bind, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Again, one of the definitions of subdue was to bring into bondage. Okay, so again, Jesus is re-emphasizing our purpose on this earth. And that is that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we bring into bondage on this earth, God has already said yes to it. He's already added his, his supernatural to our natural and he backs it up and watches over it to perform it. But we have to be the ones to do the binding. We have to be the ones to do the loosing. That word bind literally means forbid. It doesn't mean to you know, tie up in chains and lock away in a jail cell. It's whatever we forbid on earth shall be forbidden in heaven. That's what that word bind means. It means to forbid, 
to forbid something to take place, to forbid something to continue in this earth. And God will back that up. And it says, whatever we shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What are we loosing? We are loosing the will of God over that situation. We are loosing the word of God over that situation. We are loosing the power and the rearranging, changing might of the word of God into that situation because that's what will bring it back in line with what God says about it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, if you look at that scripture again, Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19, it says that, that uh, Jesus is telling us that I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, okay? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not be able to prevail or overpower or get the upper hand over the church who knows that they have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, who knows that they have the authority to bind and loose and uses it. <laughs> The gates of hell shall not prevail against the body of Christ who knows that they have the keys to the kingdom of heaven and knows how to use them, knows that we have the authority to forbid and permit, to bind and to loose, who uses their God-given uh, authority to take dominion over situations and to subdue them, to bring them into line with what God says. Amen. Gosh, it's so good. Oh, it's so good. So again, we have the authority. God created us with authority. The way that we operate and walk in our authority is to forbid and permit. And I'm going to tell you what that looks like in a little bit. We've been given the name of Jesus. Now, how do we exercise our authority? It's not us in our own physical strength. It's not us in our own physical ability. It's because we carry the name of Jesus. We have been given the name of Jesus. And what does it say? The name of Jesus is above every name and at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. So we've been given the name of Jesus. Now look at this here. This is a scripture you're familiar with, but look at it a slightly different way here. Mark 16 verse 17, okay? It says, these signs shall follow the believer. Are you a believer? Okay, so these signs are to follow you. In my name or in the name of Jesus, they shall cast out demons. Okay, they shall cast out demons. Now, typically we think of a demon-possessed person who needs deliverance and that we have the authority in the name of Jesus to cast the demons out of that person. Yes, we do, absolutely, but there's more to it than that. To cast out means to drive out, expel, draw out with force, tear out, and banish. I love that, banish. You are banished from this kingdom. Okay, so that is the signs that will follow the believer. When you are a believer and you know how to use the name of Jesus, you will cast out the demons that are trying to steal, kill and destroy in your society, in your nation, in your education system, in your government, in your churches, in the media, arts and entertainment industries, in any area of your society where you can see evil operating, in the name of Jesus, if you are a believer, you will cast those demons out of there. Because remember, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We will, we will get rid of, we will tell them to get out in the name of Jesus. We forbid you to operate or function in any area of my life that includes your loved ones. If you know that they are dealing with things that are from the enemy, you have the authority to speak to those spirits and tell them to bow their knee to the name of Jesus. Amen. So in my name, in the name of Jesus, we cast out demons. Jesus has, God has given us the name of Jesus to exercise our authority. They don't respond to get out of there in because I said so. <laughs> they don't respond to the name of Emily. 
they respond to the name of Jesus because of the authority that that represents. And I, I've used this example before, but if I tell one of my sons to go and tell one of his siblings to go and clean up his room, so my eldest son's name is Miles, if I tell Miles to go and say to my other son, Patrick, go clean up your room, Patrick's going to go, no way, you can't tell me what to do. Okay, but if Miles says to Patrick, go clean up your room because mum said so, then Patrick recognises the authority that the name of mum carries and he has to do what Miles says. Not because Miles is telling him to do it, but because he is carrying the name of mum and he has to do what Miles says because of the authority that Miles represents. And it's the same with us. We're not telling these things to bow their knee because of in our own strength or our ability, but we have because Jesus said so. We have the name of Jesus and they have to do what we say because of the authority that we represent. Awesome, hey? So again, we have authority. We have been given all of the grace that we need to do something about what's going on in, our, in the affairs of our nation at every level, every level. And we, if it's, if it's going on and, and people are getting away with it, if the devil's getting away with it, it's our fault. That's, the, the, that's the, the unfortunate truth of it. In fact, Kenneth Hagen, God told Kenneth Hagen, whatever happens in a nation happens because the church allows it to happen. That's pretty strong, hey? But it's the truth. God has given us dominion and authority in this earth and if we don't exercise it and if we don't know how to exercise it and exercise it then he's going to get away with it but this is going to change guys i this is changing we we're not going to put up with this stuff any longer it's time that the body of christ get a revelation of who they are and the authority that they carry and we start putting our foot on the devil's neck and refusing to tolerate these things in our nations any longer and recognizing again that our enemy is not people, it's the devil and targeting him rather than the person and we will get results every time. Okay, again, we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ, guys. If you, if you put it, uh, do a bit of study into what that actually means, it's amazing. Jesus is the head of the church, but we are his body. The head is always sending instructions and impulses to the body, but unless the body carry those impulses and instructions out, nothing is going to get done. The head cannot do anything apart from their body. Jesus can't do anything in this earth apart from his body carrying out his instructions, his impulses, his, his commands. We are the ones that are responsible for the practical doing things in this earth. Um, in my early days of nursing, I looked after a man who was a quadriplegic. Just to give you an example of how this of what this means. He was a quadriplegic. He had a motorcycle accident and he'd fractured a high level vertebrae in his spine and he was a quadriplegic. The only ability that he had, he, he could move his head and his face, but he had no, there was no, um, there was no pathway from his brain to his body. His body was useless. So he was in a wheelchair and he needed his nurses to do everything for him, everything bathing, brushing his teeth, feeding him everything because the signals and the impulses that were in his brain were cut off to his body. So his brain wanted to be able to pick up his fork and feed himself. His body wanted to be able to walk and you know brush his teeth and scratch his itch, but there was no connection because that had been cut off. So we need to re-establish the connection between the body of Christ and the head of the church. And when we learn how to recognize and act on the impulses that the head is sending us, we will function effectively as the body of Christ. But the good news is that even if you think that you are the tiniest cell on the tiny little toe of the body of Christ, <laughs> you still have authority over all of the power 
of the enemy because where are we seated? We are seated with Jesus. Jesus is seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are his body. We are seated with him and his body and his head are seated at the right hand of the Father far above all of the principality's power. So again, even if you don't think that you could ever make a difference, that you're insignificant, that you don't have enough faith, that you aren't as you know eloquent or well-known or schooled or educated as some other people you might think of you are still far above all of the power of the enemy you still have dominion and authority in this earth amen okay we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world now <laughs> this is a you know church, religion has messed so so many things up you we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world if you actually look into what that means it's amazing it's not just a nice thing to say oh you know we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world let's look at this a little bit closely now more closer and see what that exactly means that's taken from matthew 5 verse 13 where jesus is telling his disciples that you are the salt of the earth but if, it, if the salt loses its flavor, how can it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay, so I'm not going to read the rest of that. I want to concentrate more on what it means to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. What are the characteristics of salt? Salt adds flavor to food that is otherwise bland and unappetizing. Okay, salt adds flavor. Salt also creates thirst. We, as the salt of the earth, are supposed to add flavor to this world. We are supposed to make life interesting and exciting and add some uh, dimension to a life that is otherwise bland and unappetizing. <laughs> And salt also creates thirst. We are supposed to be creating a thirst in the unsaved for Jesus. And how do we do that? Because we are supposed to be living a victorious, overcoming life when the things that are going on in the world don't affect us. They don't touch us. And people look at us and go, how is it that you still have so much joy? How is it that your body is still functioning? You know, that you're not subject to sickness and disease. How is it that you're successful when the economy is falling down? We are supposed to function as the salt Guys, we're supposed to create a thirst in people and make life interesting, make life flavorful and create a thirst in people for the living water of Jesus. More importantly, salt is a preservative. So before the days of refrigeration, people used to encase their meat in salt to preserve it. So, you know, they, they get their piece of meat and they case it in salt and that meat would last for months and months without refrigeration because the salt was preserving it. It was, act, it was preventing corruption and decay in that meat. And we still have salted meats today, salami, pepperoni, all those kind of things, right? But more importantly, salt is a preservative. As the salt of the earth, we are supposed to be preventing corruption and decay in this earth. We are supposed to be holding back the, the corruption and the decay that is trying to overtake this earth. That is our function as salt. We are the ones for holding back lawlessness, for holding back violence, for holding back corruption, for holding back everything that is seeking to steal, kill and destroy in this earth. As the salt of the earth, it is our responsibility to do that. We are the ones that are, now I'm <laughs> going to get off topic a little bit here, but this is awesome. When I was studying this material out, I came across a scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, okay? And it's talking about the Antichrist. Now, I don't know whatever you believe about when the Antichrist is going to appear or whatever, it doesn't really matter, but I've just found a scripture that settles that. Okay, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness, okay, which is the spirit of Antichrist, is already at work 
but the one who restrains it, who restrains the spirit of Antichrist, will continue until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed. Who is the one that is restraining the spirit of Antichrist? We are. We are the ones that are restraining the spirit of Antichrist and holding him back until we are taken out of the way, until we are raptured and taken out of this earth. And that is when the lawless one will finally be revealed. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a whole big, you know, discussion about this, but as the salt of the earth, we are the ones restraining that spirit of Antichrist, that spirit of lawlessness. You think it's bad now? Imagine if we weren't here. Imagine the hell that would break loose, that is going to break loose on the earth because we are the restraining force. We are the salt of the earth. We are the ones that are holding back the corruption and the decay that is trying to overtake this earth through the spirit of Antichrist because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the authority to do something about the evil and tell it where, it, where to go and put it in its place. Okay, so when we function effectively as the salt of the earth, we are the ones that are holding back that corruption, that decay. Jesus also calls us to be the light of the world. What does the light of the world do? What are we supposed to be doing as the light of the world? What are the characteristics of light? Light drives out darkness. If you walk into a pitch black room, it doesn't matter how dark the darkness is in that room, even if you light the slightest little match, that light is enough to point the way, to direct, to show what's going on. It's enough to push back the darkness, okay? And that's what we're supposed to be doing as the light of the world. We are supposed to be pointing the way to Jesus, pointing the way to light, uh, illuminating the darkness, driving out the darkness, acting as a beacon of hope. If you think about a lighthouse on a cliff, right? Around there, it's treacherous, it's rocky, it's dangerous. And the ships rely on the light emanating from that lighthouse to provide direction and guidance and to keep them away from danger. And as the light of the world, we're supposed to be doing the same thing. We're supposed to be providing illumination and direction and warning people, don't go this way. There's, it's treacherous. It's dangerous. Stay clear. Go this way instead. And that's what we're supposed to be doing as the light of the world. Guys, so again, we are the light of the world, we are the salt of the earth, and we are supposed to be functioning effectively as those things in this earth. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. Okay. All right. So how do we do that? Um, actually, sorry, I'll just continue on with something quickly before I get into that. Um, okay. So again, we have a dominion and authority in this earth and we are told to subdue the earth. Okay. God's given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And that is to that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Jesus said that we have been given authority over all of the power of the enemy and that nothing by any means can harm us. He's given us the name of Jesus to enforce those that our authority because it's not our authority, it's the authority that we represent and that is through the name of Jesus. He's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can tap into that dunamis power that resides on the inside of that and release that power into situations because it's not by our might or our power. And again, we are not targeting these things at people. We're not speaking against people. We're not speaking against a political party. We're not speaking against a person. We are directing these at these um, these deliberate attacks at the devil because the devil is the one behind all of the stealing, killing and destroying that's taking place. He is the one who is our true enemy because our wrestle is not with flesh and blood. Jesus told us to occupy this earth until he comes. That's from Luke 19 verse 13. I don't know if you're familiar with military occupation, 
that military occupation takes place when an opposing force is defeated and the conquering army occupies the territory of the defeated foe for a designated length of time. Okay, The occupying forces are giving temp given temporary control of that territory by the conquering power and delegated authority to execute martial law against all rebels and insurrectionists. The occupying army are responsible for enforcing law and order and maintaining peace and stability for the duration of their occupation. <laughs> oh gosh, I love this. We are to occupy until Jesus comes back. We are responsible for enforcing law and order and maintaining peace and stability in this earth for the duration of our occupation. And then Jesus is gonna come back and we won't have to worry about any of this nonsense ever again. Isn't that awesome? Okay, so that is our responsibility. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of how that looks and what we do to enforce our, our position, okay? Before I do that, I wanna read you another really encouraging story just about how powerful it is when the body of believers gets together and takes a stand against the enemy. And that is with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, I was just a baby or a toddler when the Berlin Wall fell. Some of you might be familiar with what happened around uh, that event, but I'm just gonna read you a little bit about what exactly happened, and this is awesome. So the Berlin Wall had been built in 1961 by the German Democratic Republic to keep what they called the Western German fascists from entering East Germany and undermining the socialist state. But primarily it served to prevent people from performing mass escapes from communist East Germany into the free democracy of West Germany. Okay, so some of this might sound familiar to some of you guys. Okay, they were trying to steal people's freedoms and they were trying to, um, to set up a communist state. So what was happening is East Germany became communist and all of the skilled workers like the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers and all of those kind of things were fleeing East Germany into West Germany because it was a, still a free democracy and the economy was about to collapse in East Germany. So they built the Berlin Wall to keep everybody in, okay? And it was terrible. It split up families. It broke, broke up you know, relationships and homes and all that kind of thing. It was just a terrible thing that took place, okay? But in the early 1980s, an East German pastor started a Monday night prayer meeting where a handful of Christians prayed for peace in their freedom-starved country. The prayer meetings started attracting people of all denominations and demonstrators, both Christian and non-Christian, until 1989, the group had swelled to over 70,000 people, okay? Now, the wall stood, the Berlin Wall stood for 28 years until November the 9th, 1989, when suddenly the head of East Germ the East German Communist Party announced that he'd changed his mind and that East Germans could now cross freely into West Germany whenever they pleased. Okay, and he inexplicably, again, going similar situation to the story of the Dunkirk evacuation, inexplic inexplicably, he just changed his mind. Said, okay, I'm done being a dictator. East Germans can now cross freely into West Germany. And that this event led to the fall of communism all across Eastern Europe. And it started with a small group of Christians committed to pray for their nation. It didn't matter that they were from different denominations or beliefs, they were united in prayer. They were functioning effectively as the body of Christ. And in a day, the whole situation had turned around and the country got back their freedom. And what I wanna encourage you with guys is in a day, our situation can change. In a day, laws can be overturned. In a day, 
political parties can be thrown out and God's political party can be put in place in a day. It doesn't, doesn't need, you, you don't need to have all these signs and wonders happening beforehand to go, oh, it's coming, it's coming. You don't have to have any indication at all that anything's changing. But if we will commit ourselves to pray for our nation, to take our authority over the devil that's at work behind all of these things in a day, the situation can turn around. In a day, Israel went from being slaves to the Egyptians to walking freely out of their country with all their money. In a day, this, these things can take place. I'll tell you what happened. You guys might be familiar last year. This time last year, in fact, Australia was in the middle of a horrendous drought and fires. I'm sure most of you are familiar with what was happening, but the but a huge portion of Australia was burning, and the drought was horrendous. It was just, and it looked like a hopeless situation. It looked like an irreversible situation. Homes were being destroyed. People were losing their lives. Livelihoods were being destroyed. And myself included, and I know a group of believers and people probably around the world, we decided to take authority over that situation. And we would speak to the fires and say, you are exterminated, you are extinguished, you are snuffed out. We would speak to the drought and we'd say, you are broken in Jesus' name. Rain, you come, you fall on this land in, in abundance, you, white, you snuff out those fires. And we took our authority, guys. And this, this around, I think it was um, March, I think it was. Like, I don't remember the timeline exactly. But the Bureau of Meteorology was saying it was a hopeless situation that no rain was going to come for months. So it was potentially months longer that we were going to have to be dealing with these fires and this drought and it was just out of control like the, the firefighters couldn't control it but we believers decided to do something to to make an intervention to take our dominion and subdue the situation and guess what it didn't take long when we got really serious it didn't take long and suddenly rain started to fall and then it kept falling and kept falling and I don't know if you looked at the headlines but it was torrential rain and in a day it seemed like it may have been two or three days in a very short period of time all of those fires were out every single one of those fires were out areas of Australia that hadn't seen rain in decades got a torrential downpour and it's not a coincidence, guys. The devil loves to steal God's glory and say, ah, it would have happened anyway. No, it wouldn't have happened anyway. It's because people decided to take authority and to put their foot down and say, we are not tolerating this any longer. And speaking, instead of complaining about all of the people and the politics involved, you know, people were trying to blame our prime minister because of his policies on climate change and nonsense, rubbish. We take our fight to the supernatural realm and speak directly to those situations and the enemy behind it. And you can see a change in that circumstance in a day, in a day. That's, it doesn't take long, guys, if you decide you like, we've had it, had enough, I'm not going to tolerate this any longer. Okay, so we cannot be moved by what we see, what we hear or how we feel. Don't look for any sign that things are changing on the outside. Don't look for indications that your prayers are working because sometimes there isn't any visible change on the outside. Sometimes there is and you still shouldn't be moved. We don't call our faith in from the field until the full harvest is seen, okay? Just our job is just to agree with God. Our job is just to walk in our authority, release the power of the word of God out of our mouth, release the power contained in the name of Jesus, stand and having done all to stand, continue standing and God will make himself responsible for the results. Our job is just to do what he's told us to do and leave the results up to him. And in a day, guys, in a day, the whole situation can turn around. I love 
the scripture in Jeremiah 23 verse 29. It says, is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. That hammer of the word of God will, is what will break that situation into pieces. We take that hammer of the word of God and we speak to the mountain and we say, you bow your knee, you have no place to function and operate in this nation. It is written and we hammer that thing with the word of God and that mountain, that rock will break into pieces. But we have to put corresponding action to our faith. We have to do something with the tools that God has given us. Okay, so now quickly, I want to tell you how to pray effectively. Okay, so I hope that everything I've said so far has made sense. Actually, if you want to go back and listen to a more thorough teaching on this uh, subject, I've got a podcast series called You Are Involved in Politics. The Believer's Responsibility to Pray for Their Nation. And that's episodes 48 to 50 of my podcast, Faith Talks with Emily Preston. So I've gone into a bit more depth and covered a lot of the things I've already talked about. But if you want to go back and listen to that, have a listen to that podcast episode. And of course, the most important one is you are the boss of the devil, the authority of the believer, and that's episodes 39 to 44. And that in that series, I teach about the believer's authority and how we exercise our authority. So if you haven't listened to those, go and have a listen to them. I know that they'll bless you. Okay, so how do we pray for our nation? Okay, so again, we pray the prayer of authority. Now, God bless them and open their eyes but so many churches are crying out to God saying, God, have mercy on our nation. Guys, God's already had given all the mercy that he's ever going to give us. We now have to step in and do something about what's going on. God is backing us up. He's, he is not withholding anything from us. It's not up to him to pour out his spirit, pour out his mercy, to do something about it. It's our responsibility to, to take everything he's already given us and put it to use, do something with it. So how do we pray for our nation? We pray the prayer of authority using the name of Jesus and the word of God to establish God's will in our nation. I'm going to take you through this, okay, um, step by step in a second. He's, God told us in the Lord's Prayer to make a demand on the kingdom of God and say, God's kingdom, come. God's will, be done in this earth, in my nation, in my family, just as it is in heaven. That is not a begging, pleading prayer. Oh God, please, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's actually a prayer of authority. It's an authoritative command. God's kingdom, come. God's will, be done in this earth just as it is in heaven. And Jesus told us to pray that way every time we pray, okay? So that's what we are, how we're supposed to pray. Now, also Jesus told us to speak to the mountain. So we don't pray to God and say, oh Lord, we just ask you to, oh, I'm trying to think of something that I can use as an example. All right, will you, okay, so human trafficking. Let's use hu human trafficking as an example. We all know how terrible and evil that is okay oh lord we don't pray this way we don't say oh lord please do something about these human traffickers please lord you know send your angels and intervene in those situations and that's good and that's fine but there's a better way than that guys we speak directly to the spirit of behind human trafficking Okay, remember, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. So we say, in the name of Jesus, I speak to every spirit behind human trafficking and I bind you in the name of Jesus. I forbid you to operate and function in this nation. I forbid you to steal, kill and destroy from the lives of young women and, and children in this nation. I bind you in the name of Jesus. You are defeated. You bow your knee in Jesus' name. And then we can say, Lord, thank you for divine intervention. Thank you for divine connections. Lord, thank you that you send people to be in the right place at the right time to, to rescue these people. 
Um, you know, th this is what I mean, guys. We, we have to direct our prayers the right way if we want to see results, if we want to be effective in those prayers. Yes, okay, I'm going to do that. We'll use, let's talk about abortion. You know, instead of posting all about how terrible abortion is and isn't it, isn't it disgusting, isn't it disgraceful, guys, that's fine, but we're, not, we're, we're directing our efforts at the wrong place. Okay, we're not going to convince people that it's terrible. We're not going to convince these politicians to change their mind. We have to take our battle to the supernatural realm and deal with the enemy behind it. Okay, so this is how I pray. Okay, in the name of Jesus, I speak to every spirit behind abortion, every spirit that's trying to push legislation that supports abortion in this nation and I bind you in the name of Jesus. I forbid you to lie to our leaders, to our government, to our politicians. I forbid you to deceive them and blind their eyes to the truth. I forbid you to steal, kill and destroy in this nation and in the lives of the unborn. In Jesus name you bow your knee. You are under my feet. You have no place. You flee in the name of Jesus. And see, I'm exercising my dominion and authority in that situation by speaking to the mountain, by speaking to the spirit directly involved, by gagging him, by tying his hands, uh, by, by, um, by subduing him, by putting him under my feet, okay? That's using my authority and that's when you can loose the Holy, the, the word of God over that situation. And I say, Lord, I thank you that the men and women in positions of authority in our nation are a terror to evil and not to good works. They make laws and pass legislation that support godliness, that support morality, that are in line with God's righteousness and holiness and truth. And then you lose what you want over that situation. So you bind and you put under your feet what you don't want. And then you lose what you do want in the name of Jesus and speak directly to the mountain. Amen. And that's as simple as it is. And just continue to do that until you've seen the results that you want. Don't be moved by what you see, hear or feel. Don't be moved by the fact, oh no, they've brought out some other law that's made it even worse. I am not moved in the name of Jesus, you spirit of abortion, you are defeated, you bow your knee in Jesus' name. And that's how we stand and continue to stand, we stand. And we stand therefore until we see what we're standing there for. Amen? <laughs> okay, so let me see what time have I got. Okay, so in my, oh, where is it? Oh, I don't have one with me. In my booklet of Confessions for Life, actually, hang on, I'll grab one real quick. One second. <clears throat> okay, so if you, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this booklet, Confessions for Life. Okay, this is the booklet that I've put together that contains declarations for every area of your life, including your nation. So in the back here, there's scriptural declarations that you can use to establish God's will in your nation. And that's how you do it. So there's, it's all taken from scripture and you can go through these things, through these declarations and pray the prayer of authority over your nation. Okay, and it includes, now you can be specific, I've been general in this booklet. So I've, I've said here, I've put down here, I take authority over you, Satan, and every evil spirit that would seek to lie to our leaders, to deceive them or blind their eyes to the truth, and I bind you in Jesus' name. I bind every one of your demonic plans that has been set up against this nation, okay? So that's more of a general um, declaration, but you can be specific. You can speak to the specific areas that you are passionate about. And on that note, you know, like <clears throat> you might look at all the things that are going on in your nation and think, oh, I don't have time to pray for every single one of these. You don't have to. You can, there, there are areas that are, that are um, meaningful to you, okay? There are, there are areas that you feel strongly about. 
Use your authority in those areas because God might be speaking to you specifically about human trafficking. He might be speaking to someone else about abortion. He might be speaking to someone else about, you know, a, a different, another area. And if, but if we can all, you know, do what God's put on our hearts to do and do it effectively, then all of us doing our little parts effectively will cover everything that's going on. Amen. Okay, so that's a really good resource to have if you don't know how to pray the word over your nation. Okay, and I'll tell you how to get that booklet um, at the end of this uh, session. Um, yeah, and then again, of course, pray in tongues. I've I talked about this in my last live uh, session about the power of praying in tongues. But just quickly, when we pray in tongues over our nation, we are praying for situations and circumstances that we may have no natural knowledge about and we are praying the perfect plan of God the perfect will of God over that situation without us even having to know what that is so again praying in tongues is such an effective awesome way to pray over your nation and to see results okay right so I think I've covered everything I want to cover if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. I have, I'm sorry, I haven't been reading the comments as, as you've been putting them in because I've been trying to concentrate on what I've got to say. But if you have any questions about what we've talked about uh, now, please put them in the comments now uh, and then I'll answer them individually. Or if you prefer to ask a question and you don't want to um, make it public, you feel free to email me and I'll answer you over email. But if you have any questions, just pop them in the comments right now and I'll see them and I'll answer those questions now. So while you're doing that, if you would like a copy of this booklet, Confessions for Life, you can either order it from my website, which is faithtalks.com.au, or you can email me, questions at faithtalks.com.au, and uh, request your free copies. And they're all free, by the way. So the PDF and the hard copy you can get from my website or you can ask for um, one just by emailing me. And if you want several copies, you're more than welcome as well. And um, so guys, I challenge you, <laughs> instead of you know, using your social media as a platform for agreeing with all of the, the devil's works that are going on in the world, why don't we use it for a platform to encourage people to start walking in their authority and start giving people hope and helping people to recognize that, we, that we're not dealing with flesh and blood enemies. We're dealing with the devil who's our true enemy. But the good news is, is that we have authority over the devil. And really, guys, I also strongly encourage you, stop talking about the problem. <laughs> stop giving life and strength to all of the things that the devil's trying to do by talking about how terrible it all is. Oh, did you hear they did this? Oh, did you hear they did that? Isn't it terrible? Isn't it awful? You know, that's not serving any purpose except to give life to the problem. If we want to see what God says about our nation, we have to say what God says about our nation and only say what God says about our nation. Amen. So I just encourage you, don't, don't join in with all of the doom and gloom, the moaning and groaning. Just decide, I'm going to be a change agent in my nation. I'm going to take authority where authority needs to be taken. I am going to um, let the Lord use me to carry out his will in my nation by doing the same things that he's told me to do. And don't agree with the devil. <laughs> the devil would love it for you to give him lots of glory and lots of praise by telling people about how terrible it all is and what he's getting away with. But we don't do that. We will only give glory to God by saying what he says about our nation. Now, I don't think anyone's putting in any questions. Let me have a quick look. All right, guys, just quickly, if you have any questions, pop them in now. Now, I just want to cover two questions really quickly that often get asked, okay? Can I speak to things that are going on in other cities, nations, or states other than where I live, okay? So, you know, you might be in a certain state or a certain city or in a certain nation, but you see something going on somewhere else and you think, can I operate in my authority in that? The answer is yes. <laughs> 
You have been given authority over all of the power of the enemy. There is no time or distance in the spirit. So if something's going on somewhere else and you feel passionately about it and you feel that you want to take responsibility for it and pray over that, you can absolutely take responsibility for that situation and pray over that situation. There is no jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction is the earth. <laughs> there is no well you're from you know Brisbane so you only have authority in Brisbane or you're from California so you only have authority in California no there's no time or distance in the spirit if everything's under your feet then all we have to do is go get back down there where you belong it doesn't matter where it's taking place the other question that often gets asked is do I have to have other people in agreement with me the answer to that is also no, you don't. The Bible says that where two agree on earth as touching anything, it will be done by our Father in heaven. Two agreeing is you agreeing with the Word, you agreeing with God. That's two agreeing as touching that issue. That's you agreeing, God agreeing, and the Holy Spirit backs you up. So no, you don't have to have any everybody in agreement with you. Daniel was the only person that was praying in the nation of Babylon and he turned it around. Noah was the only person who believed what he did about the flood and he saved the whole human race. You don't need everybody in agreement with you. There's a common uh, scripture that's quoted. Well, it's actually not a scripture. There's a religious phrase that's quoted that says one will put a thousand to flight and two will put 10,000 to flight. Do you know that that's not a scripture? Well, the, the only scripture that talks about one putting a thousand to flight and two putting 10,000 to flight is somewhere in Exodus, I believe, where God's talking about Israel and Israel's enemies. <laughs> Guys, one single solitary believer has authority over all of the power of the enemy. So it's not like, well, I'll put a thousand to flight. I'll get someone else along. We'll put 10,000 to flight. If we can double that, we can put 20,000 to flight. Let's see how many we can get and we'll put, you know, 500,000 to flight. No, you have authority over the devil himself. If you have the authority, if you have the Holy Spirit in you and you know who you are in Christ, you have authority over all of the power of the enemy. So no, you don't have to have everyone in agreement with you. But if you decide I'm going to take authority in this situation and I'm going to see this situation turn around for the glory of God, go for it. That's God speaking to you. That's God saying, come on, I need someone to agree with me. Will you be the one? You can be the one to turn that situation in your nation around to the glory of God. Okay, guys, well... There doesn't look to be any questions. If you think of something later, send me an email. I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining in with me today. I hope that this has encouraged you. I tell you what, I got so fired up and encouraged just putting the material for this together. And it's really made me um, determined to pray for the nation and the things that are going on in the world every single day and you know you don't have to make it this huge mission where you pray all day every day five minutes five minutes in your morning on the you know on your prayer time just take authority over the situations that are meaningful to you declare god's purpose and plan over your nation that's enough that's all god needs to get to work in the affairs of your nation Amen. Well, God bless you all. Happy Thanksgiving to all of my beautiful American friends. There's a lot to be thankful for. It may not look like it on the surface, but there are lots to be thankful for. So bless you all. Um, have a beautiful week and I will see you the next time we get together.